Good morning, church. Welcome to Bloomfield Congregational Church, where no matter who you are, no matter where you are in life's journey, no matter what you've done, you are welcome here no matter what. Seriously. Happy Father's Day to you if you are a father and to all of you who in so many different ways care for God's children. I extend that welcome to you as well. If you'd like to contact us or learn more about our community of faith, you can do that by finding our contact information on our website at firstchurchbloomfield.org, or you can use the chat function if you are connecting with us on our live stream, or you can send us an email or call us. The information is on our website, also on the order of service that is posted on our website. If you would like to become a member of this church, yes, we are still having people join the church even in the midst of the COVID-19 from online. So if you would like to learn more and join this church, feel free to reach out to us with that contact information, and we'll make sure that you get connected with that information. So now, let us take a moment to breathe. Let us take a moment to lay aside all those things that can hold us back and hold us down the junk and the gunk that clings to you and clings to me, that can just bear down on our lives and wear us out. I invite you to lay that all aside during this worship experience. And to remember that God has a gift for you, but it's not just God giving the gift, that just with everything else that God has for us, that we have a role in this together, partnering with God. And your role in that, in that situation, is to accept that gift, to open that gift, and to use that gift. So now, let us come together as we say our call to worship, found in your order of service. Questions are key to a growing faith. Jesus often taught through questions. Jesus didn't say, here's a book of exactly what to do for every circumstance in life. Jesus said, let me tell you a story. Jesus wants us to ask. Jesus wants us to wonder. Jesus wants us to think. So we don't get stuck with bad answers. So we grow in our faith so we can continue to do His work in new ways in these times. Now let us join together in our opening hymn, Renew Thy Church. The lyrics will appear on screen.
Let us join together for our unison prayer. God of grace, when we, like young sheep, sometimes stray from your way, you call us to return to you. You call us to see the error of our ways, to turn, change our ways, and return to your way. You call us to be witnesses to your way. You follow your, to follow your words, to follow your example. You call us to follow the way of love, the way you loved, the way God loves, recklessly, abundantly, radically. Please be with us as we strive to return to you as we strive to follow your way, your way of radical, abundant, reckless love. Amen. Now please enjoy the first reading as well as music by Scott Troyer and Katie Nelson Troyer. Good, Good morning, morning, Bloomfield. Bloomfield. You're probably looking at us and thinking, hey, that's a lot of red. Uh, you guys are wearing a lot of red today, and Katie's keyboard is red. Well, we're doing that because today our song that we want to share with you is a song called Reckless Love. And yeah. love and the color red go together. They do. And uh, Katie's going to tell you how the chorus goes. Yeah. So the chorus says, oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down. It fights till I'm found and it leaves the 99. And a lot of people ask, what does that mean? Fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. What does that mean? Well, it actually comes from a parable that Jesus told to the people when he was here on earth. And it says this, verse 3, So he told them this parable, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So that's where that comes from. Uh, we hope that you catch on to this one. We both really love this song, Reckless Love. spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me so so kind to me and oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God oh it chases me down fights till I'm found leaves a 99 and I couldn't burn it and I don't deserve
There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, and coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. We will now have the pastoral prayer followed by the Lord's Prayer. Gracious God, while the air has gotten continually cleaner since March, when we slowed our economy and the industrial pollutants have reduced and we see the sky clear and the blue skies even bluer, even though the air has gotten cleaner, there are many people in this world who still can't breathe. Some, it's from COVID. Some, it's from cancer and emphysema and other diseases. But for others, it's just from the weight of the world. The weight of how many things are going on in the world. And for others, it is the continuing pandemic of racism that has people unable to breathe. We acknowledge Juneteenth and the significant step that was taken on that day in 1865, but we have so much further to go. And there are people today, friends and people who we don't know, but we are still to be their keepers, to be their helpers, to be their champions, to be their partners, to be their allies. People who are still not okay. Help us to have the courage to follow your way, to do the hard work of the challenge that needs to take place both in the world and within ourselves. To have the right intentions, to be able to follow you more closely, to do the right thing. We ask for your presence in the midst of so many other struggles that are still going on within the midst of the world that children are experiencing, parents are experiencing, caregivers are experiencing. The financial hardships, the changes in just the way life is supposed to go, for the rites of passage that have been changed or just missed, whether they are birthdays or graduations or anniversaries or just the ability to give each other a hug. We recognize those financial challenges, the pressures that can be on relationships, the temptations to go back to the addictions or the addictions that 
seem to make something better until we recognize it's just made it 10 times worse. We ask to be present for people who are experiencing stress and anxiety or depression, for the medical workers and those returning to work, and to ask for common sense in our leaders and people as we begin to be given more and more freedoms to take those responsibilities seriously and recognize that our actions are not just for ourselves, but to remember that our actions are for other people as well and to remember the interconnectedness of all of us and in all things. Help people feel you walking with them in whatever way they need to feel it, whether they believe in you or not. And when their need is greater, help them stand. And when their need is even greater still, help them feel you lift them up and carry them in their time of pain. And on this day, we ask a special blessing for Dave Weaver and Anne and their family. We commend his spirit to you, God. And we know that while our hearts are broken, that he is well and that he has heard the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. And now, as Jesus himself taught us, let us together pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'll be reading to you from Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and traveled to a distant country and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead, and he is alive. He was lost, and he is found. And they began to celebrate. Now the elder son was in the fields, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked, What's going on? He replied, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has gotten him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never 
given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. When this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed a fattened calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you're always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost, and he has been found. The Word of God for God's people. So this week is Question and Answer Sunday. For those of you who are new to this church, what is Question and Answer Sunday? Well, if you're on our email list, we sent notes out and said, if you have a question that you would like to ask, it could be about theology, it can be about God, it can be about the Bible, it can be about the world, it can be about just about anything, and we'll try to take it on. Sometimes we end up answering a series of different questions, but every once in a while, a question that is so important comes up that we focus just on that. And someone submitted this question. Why did Jesus have to die like that? Did he have to die like that? Why did he have to suffer? Why did it have to go on like that? And then the person added all kinds of things about what's going on in this world and how that tied to that. And it was so important that that's what we're going to focus on. And so the question, why did Jesus have to die like that? And first, you know, sometimes it takes me a while to get to the punchline because I'm trying to give you all kinds of context and information. But this time, I'm going to give you the punchline right up front, and then we're going to dig into it a little bit. So why did Jesus have to die like that? He didn't. He didn't. Jesus didn't have to die like that. And I know this is going to come as a big surprise to a lot of you because we have been told over and over and over and over that he had to die on the cross just like that. But that's not what Jesus thought. That's not what God intended. That was created far later by other people. And one of the people who helped develop this idea was the Archbishop of Canterbury by the name of Anselm. Back, not just like in ancient times, but in you know, the year 1100 AD, that wasn't even a thousand years ago. So he was the Archbishop of Canterbury, and he lived in a period of time where there was this organizational structure in society called feudalism. And there were these really powerful people, and if you made a mistake, you had to atone for that. You had to substitute something you had done wrong and offended somebody and had to atone with that by substituting something else. So as he was trying to do all this figuring out, why did Jesus have to die? How did this happen? What was the role that was being played? Was this God's plan all along? And he said, yes, this is God's plan all along. And what was actually happening was something that he called substitutionary atonement. Might sound like a kind of legal type of term. It was beginning something called legalism in Christianity. Taking the Bible and some of the really important things about Jesus and God and distilling it down till it just seemed like a contract. You could imagine a term like substitutionary atonement showing up in some kind of big contract that says page 52, section I, section B, subsection C, Romanet 3, and then you will see substitutionary atonement. It seems like a trade, like they were doing a deal, which is what his thought process was, that we had to make a deal with God, that all of the sin for individuals and people over and over and over in time and history, that God wouldn't just accept, the Bible says he accepts, that God accepts, which is just our being contrite and our turning away from our ways and turning back to God's ways and returning to God. He's like, no, that can't possibly be it because that sin is so great that we need some kind of trade that's going to be acceptable to God. So God sent the perfect person in Jesus, and that's the only way because you had to atone for it and you had to have a substitute for it, which is the context that he lived in. And so we came up with this idea that had to have this exchange, which meant one thing. 
It was all about Jesus on the cross and not about the other stuff, which made it into Jesus was born to die. And there are actually songs out there, Christmas songs in the Christian contemporary genre that just says, baby born to die. That's the name of a song out there. A lot of people believe this, that Jesus' sole purpose was to be born so that he could die on a cross for everyone, for everyone who ever lived and everyone who will ever live so that the blood of him drips and makes them clean, that his blood washes them clean, just born to die in this idea of a legal exchange and a contract with God of substitutionary atonement, exchanging him for everybody else. And what did that leave out? It left out the entire life of Jesus, which we've talked about before, how much of Christianity has just ignored the life of Jesus, which is the primary point of him being sent. In addition to that, it also eliminates the resurrection because it's all about his death. Now, how many times do you think Jesus said substitutionary atonement is the reason I came in the Gospels? How many times do you think Jesus said that? None. None. Absolutely zero. He didn't hint at it, didn't talk about it. And the only way some people read it back into the Bible is because we've been indoctrinated with this idea for so long. Never did Jesus talk about that. Jesus' death was an absolute disaster at the time. Jesus' death was an absolute disaster. The disciples splintered away everywhere. They were terrified. The movement was at risk of dying. The whole point, all that was huge about Jesus' message was his life and then his resurrection. If he had died and remained died, the movement would be gone. It wasn't the point for him to be born just to die. His life, his message, and then his resurrection. And when he came back, he still had a message. And his message was to be a witness to my life. Not to be a witness about substitutionary atonement. It was a witness to be witnesses to my words, to be witnesses to my example, to be witnesses to my life. That's what he talked about when he came back in the resurrection. So if the way we reconcile with God isn't through this idea of substitutionary atonement, and it wasn't the fact that he had to die that way, what were some of Jesus' thoughts and ideas around how we do reconcile when we have separated from God, when we have turned away from God? how we turn back and how we do reconcile with God? Well, Jesus talks about that in Luke 15, 11 to 32. And a lot of you know that section that was read wonderfully by Suzanne Robinson. is the parable of the prodigal son. But it's actually known by something else as well. It's known as the parable of the forgiving Father, because as much as we think about the son's actions and going away and then coming back, and then there are scenes later with the older brother, the central character here always is the forgiving father and how the father is acting. So let's go ahead and get into this section of Luke for a moment. So we know how the, uh, the prodigal son, the younger brother, went out to his father one time and said, Dad... I want you to give me half of everything that is owed to me in my inheritance. First, he's not owed anything because it's not supposed to come until after he dies. So what the son is actually doing is a big insult to the father. He's basically saying, you are dead to me. Give me my half and I will go. It's not just about the money. There's this tremendous insult. It's about the worst thing you could do as a child to a parent to ask that to say those kind of things. So he asked that and he went off and 
spent it all. And then finally, in, in verse 17, we have this part where he has that change of heart. But when he came to himself, after he had been doing all the things that separated himself from God, all the things that separated himself from his father, all that separated himself from the other people who loved him and helped him in his life, he came to himself. And he said, I will get up and go to my father. He made that turn, turned away from his ways to return to the father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned. He will be contrite. What God asks for is a contrite heart and to leave our ways and return to God and God's ways. I am say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And then after saying those words, actually going on that journey that says there in verse 20, so he sent off and went to the Father, displaying those things that Jesus requires of us, being contrite, making that turn, and then walking back away from our life, back to the Father. And then the next word, but, but, while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with love and compassion, and he ran to him with his, and put his arms around him and kissed him. And then the son said the words to the father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. But remember, the father ran to him before he ever heard those words because he knew, seeing him, how much love he had for him. How much love he had for him. And where it says ran, it doesn't sound like that big a deal in today's context. But back then, he would have had these long robes. And he would have had to lift up these robes. And he would have had to run. And it would have been considered undignified to do that. So he would have had to show his feet. He would have had to show his ankles and part of his lower legs. And that was considered undignified. And you just didn't do that. But the father didn't care. He had a reckless, undignified love for his son. A reckless Love that was disregarding the, the, the insults from before and all he had done and the wastefulness, but knew that he had been contrite and turned from his ways and returned to the Father. The kind of love that God has is a reckless, reckless kind of love like we heard in that song. We also heard in the first reading that was done by Katie Troyer right before they said this song about the parable that happens just a little before this one about the forgiving father and the prodigal son, about the hundred sheep, the one and the ninety-nine. And what happens here? Does God sacrifice the one sheep for the ninety-nine? No. God leaves the ninety-nine to go take care of the one that is at risk the one who is at risk of being hurt, that is lost and alone and needs to be saved and taken care of. He doesn't sacrifice the one for the 99, just like he didn't sacrifice the one for 99 million or 9 billion or 99 billion people who have lived since the existence of history. But so what? So what? Maybe all this is just a bunch of seminary nonsense and theological gobbledygook. Why should you care about any of this? Here's why. If this was God's plan, if this was preordained to take care of some kind of thing that began way at the beginning of time, time that God created in the first place, if this was all the kind of preordained stuff that people say it is, if this is all God's plan to do this, then all kinds of things can be called God's plan, and just whatever is in the world can just be said that it's just God's plan. And how does that get abused? Slavery. Slavery, just part of God's plan. Just, we happen to be the ones who are powerful and enough to go get the slaves. If it wasn't that way, they wouldn't have given us all this power to do and build the country the way we built it. Sorry, it's just God's plan. That's just the way it is. 
continued racism today, just part of God's plan. Eventually, when God wants to fix it, God will fix it. It's just part of God's plan. Just wait it out. We'll be okay. Destruction of the environment. What we have been given as a planet created by God to be stewards and good stewards of the environment, we don't need to do that. We don't need to be good stewards. Just use it. That's just all part of God's plan. When God wants to fix that, God will come in and fix that just fine. The thousands of children who will die today because of lack of food and lack of clean water and lack of adequate medical care, it's part of God's plan. It's part of God's plan. Evil, evil leaders, evil things that are going on in the world, wars that are tearing people apart, creating refugees with children, creating humanitarian crises, just all part of God's plan. That's not part of God's plan. The structural and institutional Ways that we have created evil in this world. Oh, just all part of God's plan. God will fix it in God's time. That's not the way God works. That's not the biblical God. That's not the God that I know. That's not the God who exists in this world. The idea that it's all God's plan is not God's way. This idea that it's all God's plan is not God's way. God did not plan for Jesus to be tortured, captured, betrayed, stripped, whipped, tortured with all kinds of inhumane Instruments nailed to a cross? That was not God's plan. Jesus got killed because he was protesting for the people who were oppressed. Jesus was killed because he had a message that the powers that be, the people of the world who had the power, both religious and economic and structural and social, didn't want to hear because he was disrupting the status quo. Jesus was killed by the powers because he was disrupting what they didn't want to have disrupted. Just like the Reverend Oscar Romero got killed for defending the oppressed in Latin America. Just the same way that Dietrich, Reverend Dietrich Bonhoeffer got killed in Germany protesting the abuses of the Nazi regime. Just like Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. got killed for advocating for those who needed advocating for. And Jesus wouldn't have just been out here today just marching. Jesus might be Killed today because in addition to protesting these things, Jesus physically turned tables over to try to undo the structure to make his point. No. Jesus was killed by those forces. Why else do you think, you think God was happy about that? Why then when Jesus died was there thunder and angry things that came and earthquakes and things that shook the ground because God was angry because God didn't want to see that happening? And God said, no, this is not how this is going to end. God said no to the ways of the world and the powers that be who took his son and his life and his example to show us how to live, how to bring the kingdom of God here on earth, now in this place. He took him and tortured him and killed him. And God said, no, this is not how this is going to end. He created the resurrection that overturned death so that we could have Jesus for all time walking alongside as we need to do the work that Jesus said for us to be witnesses to his life and his words and his example today. For who? For the oppressed. Not for the 99, not for the majority, for the one, for the minority the one for whom things are structured systematically against. 
And the example that we have seen time and time again is to resist, to walk, to say things, to show the abuses of the system the way Jesus did, even if we're turning tables over in the process of doing it. No, Jesus did not need to die that way. But he did, fighting for the causes that he believed in. And God said, no, I will not let that stand. And so Jesus came back to tell us to be witnesses, to follow his words, to follow his example, for the same people that he fought for, the one that society was standing against. Amen. You may have heard the question, what would Jesus do? Well, that question implies, what would I do if I was Jesus? Well, today I haven't taken that question on, but one of my favorite songwriters, Paul Coleman, has. I hope you enjoyed this song, If I Was Jesus, as we take our offering today. Hey, this is Paul Coleman. I'd like to say hi to everyone at Blooming Field Congregational Church. And hi to Pastor Sean. I know that you would say Sean, but um, that's really not how you say his name. It's Pastor Sean. Sorry that you've said it wrong or been lied to. Uh, but Sean is actually the correct way to say it. Um, my justification is it's English. English comes from England and they say Sean. Pastor Sean, or hey, Pastor Sean, how are you, mate? So sorry that you've said it wrong. Um, but anyway, my name is Paul, and I'm a friend of Pastor Sean. <laughs> and he's asked me to sing you a song. So hey, everybody, this song is called If I Was Jesus. And uh, I've had some interesting emails about this song. Let's see what you think of it, If I Was Jesus. If I was Jesus, I'd have some real long hair, a robe and some sandals, it's exactly what I'd wear. I'd be the guy at the party, turning water to wine. Yeah, me and my disciples, we'd have a real good time. Jesus, I'd have some friends that were poor, I'd run around with the wrong crowd, but man, I'd never be bored, yeah, I'd heal me a blind man, get myself crucified, by politicians and preachers, not Pastor Sean, who got something to hide. was Jesus uh -huh. If I was Jesus uh -huh. If I was Jesus I come back from the dead Walk on some water Just to mess with your head I know your dark little secrets, Pastor Sean. I'd look you right in the face. And I'd tell you, I love you with amazing grace. Hanging on your cross
if I was Jesus uh -huh. If I was Jesus
Now you're invited to join for coffee, questions, and connections where we continue our worship experience by connecting with each other and continuing to ask questions if you have any after this service. But before we end, the benediction. May love bless you and keep you. May love make its face shine upon you and be gracious unto you and be gracious unto you may love lift up its countenance its countenance upon you and give you peace and give you peace. Go in peace. something burning deep inside your coat. From the top of this mountain, I can see Canaan, the blue of the vineyard, and the gold of the grain. Right across that river, candles flicker. If I didn't know better, I'd call it a dream. The walls of Jericho and the walls of Jerusalem came tumbling down long ago and they never got built again. Will you stand in the rubble where the rocks and bullets whine? Will you stand in the garden, reach your hand across the line? From the top of this mountain, I can see Canaan, the blue of the I didn't